All right. Well, hi everyone to the first inaugural uh, demo for this team. Let's see how it's going to go. But uh, I am going to uh, give you a short intro on what is expected here. So basically, the expectation here is um, low level technical discussion um, that is uh, uh, developing around uh, the work that was accomplished throughout the week. Uh, whoever has something to show uh, can put themselves on there and we can go and discuss uh, what value does it have and uh, if it has any value, uh, how to increase it or uh, if it doesn't, why, did, why was it done? Um, then more importantly, um, with whatever demo we do here, uh, it is also important to just go through the motion of um, if, this is, if something that you're showing is hard, you should do it regardless of how hard it is. So if something is not working properly, that is the point to highlight. And we want to see like whether there are better ideas or whether we can do something um, a bit better uh, as, a, as a whole team. Um, this has been successful in the two other teams I was running. And um, at the beginning, it is a bit awkward until you get into it. And then when you get into it, um, there is uh, a lot of value you extract from just understanding where others are in their work and what kind of workload can be um, uh, improved. I might be jumping in to ask questions. Um, some of them are gonna be, well, actually most of them are gonna be very dumb, um, but I'm hoping I'm gonna squeeze in a, a nice question uh, periodically as well. So uh, everyone is encouraged to stop folks and ask questions and do the same thing um, over and over again until we get to the bottom of it. Um, for now, once a week, um, we'll do Fridays most likely uh, from, from next week. Let's see how this uh, goes first. So with that, um, Andrew has a first demo he wants to share. So uh, Andrew, share your screen and take it away. Cool. Um, so this is actually a pretty old thing that I started working on probably at the beginning of December and it got delayed because we realized that the Prometheus metrics for Sidekick were basically terrible um, and pretty much random. Uh, so you might find metrics for one sidekick instance or one sidekick process inside a cluster, but none of the others. And so at that point, it kind of didn't really make any sense to continue with it. But then um, I think Matthias uh, in the memory team fixed that. And uh, so, so we now have metrics in sidekick. And so I can continue with this since I started finishing off today. And so basically all it is was, it's kind of like a first step in the direction of error budgeting. So I think that one of the things that's gonna be really important with this team is trying to kind of push left and, and push, you know, basically figure out attribution. Like who can we, uh, who can help us with, with particular problems that we see in the code? and uh, which teams do we need to speak to? And so with that in mind, we started attributing all of the sidekick workers. And uh, instead of attributing them with teams, we decided to attribute them with the feature category because uh, features, sort of sidekick workers are, are pretty well sort of tied with features, but teams tend to move around a lot and, and different teams take over different features. So it seemed like a better fit. Instead of saying that this team is responsible for this, for this sidekick worker, we can say, this uh, feature is associated with the sidekick worker. And then as the teams change around, we can go look at the stages mapping file, um, the stages.yaml in the handbook, and that helps us map it to a team. So in here we can say, you know, if I take a word, is that, um, you know, if I say, oh, we've got a problem with an incident management feature, or actually let's take a, I'll, I'll explain it better in a, in a second. But if we say, oh, the pages feature, 17% of the time is, is giving us errors. We can go look in here and we will see that the pages feature, the person to speak to is probably Darby Frey. 
So he's the person that we need to go and speak to about that. But so giving a actually, quick demo. It's not, actually, it's not. Go back. Yeah. So if you go, it's pro, uh, groups and then it's release management section. Oh, so yeah, sorry. Yeah, John yeah, Hampton. I, yeah, John, John Hampton. Yeah, that, thank you. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's totally, yeah, it's, I skipped a... Uh, yeah so but but we can we we can totally sort of um you know we've got this look up now so we can basically say we have this each um worker has a feature category and then we can map it back to team and in future we could start sending alerts to channels specific to teams where we could say hey like could you guys jump on a call with us because we're seeing a problem with this feature so going back here uh I guess maybe a good place to start is by kind of explaining the the attributes that we've got on every um, worker. And so... Could you, you show know, us, Will, how you get them into Grafana? Because I know sure. how they live on the workers and how they're added there now, but like, yeah. how does that get here? Okay, so... Um, oh, sorry, let's go here and... <laughs> Um, oh, that's very lucky. I actually happen to be in exactly the right place. Uh, I think I... So, uh, where is our labels? So, basically on, you know, we added the, the attributes and then we added um, some functions to, to the classes, uh, like get feature category, Latency sensitive worker question mark. Uh, I don't know how do Rubius specifically say the question mark at the end when you when you're talking about a um, a method that's got a question mark on it, or would you just ask say it in a questiony kind of way? Um, Go for the questiony kind of way. I want to see. You okay. Do that. Okay. So worker class has external dependencies. Uh, worker has external dependencies. Um, but yeah, so, so basically the, the, the classes have these methods on them. So we know that the class is, uh, you know, whatever, mailer or, or whatever. And so we can, we can pull these off there. Obviously it's only if um, the class includes work attributes, which we test. Um, and funny story, but the first version of this got all the way into staging uh, without that and didn't work very well, but we fixed it. Um, but anyway, so we, we take those labels and we apply them onto um, the uh, job, sidekick jobs completed second. So if you go take a look at this in Prometheus, it looks, the, these have now got a lot of labels on them. It, it, it's, it doesn't look great, but it doesn't add to the cardinality because each worker only has one specific label. So we're not kind of getting this cardinality explosion, but it's kind of, because uh, the class is already there anyway. Yeah, the class is already there. So we're not multiplying. It's not like uh, each one is like got a yes and a no for latency sensitive. So it kind of, uh, let's just, uh, I'm in the wrong Prometheus here. So if we go take a look on here, we get oh, that. Dash uh, app. Um, Why do you use this one and not the Thanos one? Because uh, I've been having some problems with Thanos today, but I'm going to go to the Thanos one now. Well, um, no, I was asking because it was very slow for me just a few seconds ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is pretty much why I spend quite a lot of time just going to the individual ones, sadly. Um, and then so you can see here we get, you know, this uh, particular one is the new Epic queue um, that we're talking about here. So I guess that's for when you create a new Epic on GitLab, it spawns something on the new Epic queue. And you can see here, we've got all these attributes now, like does it have external dependencies? No. Uh, what's the feature category? Agile portfolio management. Um, uh, and then obviously we've got like whether the job succeeded or failed, whether it's, um, it's not latency sensitive, um, and then the priority and, and all the other attributes that we used to have before. But we, we get these new attributes and so we can aggregate everything up according to those attributes. And that gives us this kind of first version of this dashboard. 
And so technically what we can, I, I haven't been able to, I'd like to sort this every time by like worst at the top, but for some reason I can't get tables in Grafana to do that. Um, so obviously the two sort of columns in this, in this dashboard, the first one is Aptex, which is your, uh, what percent, effectively what percentage of your requests complete within an acceptable amount of time. So we want that to be 100% and uh, the lower it is, the worse it is. And then this is what percentage of your requests or workers in this case end in, in an error. And obviously for that we want lower is better. So the, the, the two are slightly different. But if we roll it up by feature category, we can see here that sort of 5% of, of uh, things that are not owned are, don't meet their latency requirements. Um, and that's kind of not surprising. Like obviously the, the stuff that nobody owns is always the stuff that's gonna perform the worst. And when we did all that work attribution, one of the things we said was we should really aim to, 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 to reduce that down to zero or close to zero over time. But it, it's kind of interesting that as soon as we put it on, those are the, the things that, that, that aren't um, making the, the requirements. The, the other thing to point out is that um, the values that I've used are kind of like, I just uh, did a thumb suck on them and we should probably discuss them with the wider audience. And so what I'm saying is that if something, if we declare that something's latency sensitive, we say that it needs to finish within 10 seconds. So we, this was a discussion I was having with Sean on Friday, I think we were saying, the infrastructure team will, will make sure that, that uh, your job starts on time. If, if it's a latency sensitive job, we'll make sure it starts on time. As long as the, the engineering teams that develop that job, make sure that it finishes quickly. Like we can't have things that take 10 minutes to run and we, it, it, well, if something takes 10 minutes to run, we can't guarantee that we can start it, you know, in, in five milliseconds. So, so what we're saying here is that, um, for things that are latency sensitive, they need to finish within 10 seconds. And things that are not latency sensitive, they need to finish within uh, five minutes um, on, on, on average. And if we, if we aggregate that up, you can see here that, you know, other than not owned, the next slowest thing is, is container registry. And then one of the cool things you can do in Grafana now is you can actually click on that and it will filter. And you can see here that Container registry has got these two jobs, and this is the worst one performance-wise. So delete container repository, whatever that was. So if we go take a look at that, we're going to here. Um, well, actually, we know is it latency sensitive? No. So that actually tells us that that's in three percent of cases that's taking longer than five minutes. Which, like, to delete container repository that seems like quite a long time so maybe that is something that's worth investigating I don't I don't know I mean I know everything around the registry is really slow so maybe that's something we've just got to kind of accept for now um, but anyway that's what that is and then I still haven't quite figured out how to remove filters with this Grafana this new Grafana interface so I just remove it from the URL which isn't very good but it'll be the trick so really funny, Andrew, because you just mentioned registry and I uh, searched through my inbox and I find a three months old issue raised by, uh, guess whom, Andrew, um, <laughs> saying that yeah. this same thing, it is performing really badly. And uh, last yeah. update was last night um, from one of the directors saying we need to schedule this investigation. So, yay. Yeah. I, it, like everything with the registry, everything that talks to Docker slash distribution seems to be really slow. Um, yeah. So if you look at the endpoints on the API that talk to it, it's the same. So obviously the next step with this is obviously to do the same thing with uh, routes or controllers and actions perhaps. And then once we've got that, we can, we can have a much more overall view because obviously Sidekick is only part of the system. But once we have everything, then we can start prioritizing and maybe using this as, a, as an error budget. And so saying, you know, the, the container registry 
like that team perhaps needs to consider spending a little bit more time addressing technical debt over the next month or two because you know they're the team that that has consistently the the, the worst aptex scores or or whatever obviously the one thing that this doesn't take into account at the moment is that we're not weighing this by the number of requests so it might be that this you know i, I had that issue with the let's just go back to it. this delete container repository now we're saying that in three percent of the cases it took more than five minutes maybe there were only like seven requests in the last 24 hours and it doesn't make sense for that team to kind of then spend the next month focusing on this because it's, you know, it's, it, it, it happens every now and again, but it's not that bad. And so before this becomes like a proper error budgeting tool for us to like help drive those discussions, we need to include some sort of waiting so that we don't kind of like say, oh, there's this thing that happens once a week and every time it runs, it's slow. 100% of the time, it, it, it doesn't achieve its aptex score you know it probably doesn't matter um there's another case of that where um, there's a feature category called license management and like 50 percent of the time that it runs it ends in an error but it only runs like twice a day so is that a problem or not i don't know but it, it's it's not a high priority right like um What's, what's more interesting, oh, it's interesting because obviously it's run since then and I, I don't know, but you know, pages, if we go look at this, um, there's a thing called, um, yeah, this uh, pages domain SSL renewal. And oh, also the other thing you can do is you can actually click through. So it's quite nice. So you can click through from that table and it'll take you here. And that so, said that it doesn't have external dependencies, but I'm pretty sure that it should have external dependencies. Yeah, that that's that makes sense because I guess it's what's it talking to for the the um, SSL renewal? Is it talking to? Um, Let's encrypt most likely. Right? Yeah, that's what I yeah. was thinking. Yeah. yeah, but I mean the error like thirty three percent of those end in errors, right? And so that to me sounds shocked. like I'm, I'm not shocked because Let's Encrypt is very specific about what can pass and can't. So right. uh, if you don't pay special attention to that renewal, 90% of the time it's going to end in error if, if, if the user doesn't take an action. So the, the, um, the other thing I've learned with Let's Encrypt is if you get things wrong too often, you get blacklisted very quickly yep. and then you've got problems, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's exactly um, one of my pet peeves that I had when we built in the Omnibus support. Yeah, it's... I've made that mistake and it's like use the staging server until you're absolutely sure you know what you're yep. doing it's like I know what I'm doing <laughs> no nope, I'm bad now um, but you know so this is kind of maybe help drive that conversation with the team and sort of like help us define error budgets it's very very early at the moment but it kind of feels like a first step and I guess that's the end of my demo does anyone have any questions other questions um when you had this unfiltered a second ago, yeah. um, there was feature category not owned, but there was also feature category blank? Yes, I looked at that. That is because of the active job colon colon. Um, oh, the mailers. The mailers, yeah. It's that mm. one. And I don't really know what to do about that at the moment. I was, I was kind of deciding oh, whether, yeah. I think that... I think we can merge that with not owned because yeah. mailers belong to somebody, but all mailers is one of these things that, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just do a label replace for the moment on the, on the client side and just kind of treat it as a, um, yeah, I think it could also apply to anything that's sort of, you know, um, done with, without an explicit worker class. Um, but I think mailers is the only place we use that right now. Um, yeah, I, I, I went looking and that was the only thing. Uh, it's just, I don't know if this filter is going to work. Let's see. So do we know whether there is any validation uh, inside of GitLab, like through Danger or whatever else that specifies what is, like if you create a new worker, what is the structure? Of, we have, uh, we have tests. We have tests for yeah. that. But okay. uh, this kind of worker is like, 
within yeah. Rails, so it's not defining yeah, 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 I get that source code, yeah. and that's why it. Yeah. yeah my, okay. my, uh, my first my first thing was like, oh, it's somebody's created a new worker and they haven't added the attributes, and then I remembered that we specifically added a test for that, um, which which is good. yeah, the the filter doesn't seem to work very well with um, with empty, but yeah, it it is I checked it in its manners. Yeah, um, and. How do we keep track if a feature category changes? Like not changes ownership, I mean just changes. <laughs> like, you know, say we changed importers to something else. Um, is, that, is that a way so, we can do that? I, I think they're supposed I, to be pretty stable, but yeah, I, stable in the startup I mean, is still not very long. Yeah, the, there isn't anything. I mean, if you were to look over, depending on the time frame that you used, it would probably, uh, well, what would happen is that for the time that it was, you know, the way Prometheus would, would handle it is that during the time that it was belonged to one feature category, it would be attributed there and then it would switch over. So, you know, 50% of the time of this 24 hours, it was owned by, you know, continuous integration. And then the other 50% of the time was owned by Kubernetes configuration the attribution would sort of be 50-50, but there's nothing really. Oh, and you'd get, uh, the other thing, Sean, is that you'd get double, um, you'd see it twice in this list. You'd see it, because it, uh, it, it would be, yeah. Sorry, my question was slightly different. Like, okay. if, we, if we changed importers, the category, to be just like named something else, um, yeah. in that website repo, yes. do we then know to update that? automatically yes. somehow? Um, so, yeah. okay. so what would happen is that um, there's a, it, it's not totally automatic. What happens is that we import the stages YAML file occasionally, not on every single build, um, but there's a, there's a script on the GitLab. Just shout if you think I'm answering the wrong question again. But in the GitLab repository, there's a script which will take the stages YAML file and generate a kind of intermediate form of basically, which is effectively a list of feature categories. And then the CI script will validate, the CI uh, job will validate that, that the feature categories match up with that. And kind of mm -hmm. the idea is that every now and again, we go and run the script, we get a new list of feature categories, and then we check that in. Um, can you, and can you go the alternative is, is we could do it on every build, but it kind of chose, I didn't want to break the Git our build, sorry, the, the GitLab build when the handbook page was broken, for example. Can you go and show that right now in uh, oh. in the GitLab repo so we know where it is? Yeah, it's um, so so in the it looks like I put it in the root. Which can I, oh, config config feature categories. And then at the top, it's got this header. This file contains a list of all feature categories in GitLab. I'll make it a bit bigger. Um, it is generated from the stages file at the location. If you'd like to update it, please run. And so the, the alternative is that we could just generate this on every CI build. Um, I just kind of felt at the time that it made sense to not like break the GitLab build if something was wrong with the handbook. And it kind of gives you a bit of a, a buffer between, you know, because obviously the whole world and his wife are working on the, um, on the feature categories uh, uh, file, you know, that gets changed every day and something could break in there. And we don't want that to break the, the, the GitLab build. Um, so, you know, the idea is that this will get run. I mean, it'd be interesting to run it now and see if it's, uh, has changed, or if the feature categories are still stable from the last time when we ran it. Yeah, well, I think that answers my question anyway. So, like, yeah, yeah. thank you. So you, you can see that since the last time we ran it, we've got a whole, quite a lot. Of, oh, look at that. There's actually an Epic's uh, feature category now. And so ideally, that one we were looking at, which was under Agile Project Management, should probably go under Epic's. Yeah, I didn't actually know that was going to have changed. I was just just curious. Yeah, no, it's it's and agile project management no longer exists. So if I check this file in now, the build would break. Um, so that that's been kind of interesting. 
how do we ensure that we this stays updated and then periodically? Should we just yeah. have a, a thing that runs and shouts on Slack so we can take a look at it? Like a while, dry run? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Something like that, because like in this case, a human will need to take a look at it and fix. Yeah, and, and fix the, yeah. Because that's another thing is that we don't want the GitLab build to break just because products have made a product decision. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's um, that's probably a, a, a takeaway. Is we should let's do uh, create an issue for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Just yeah, I know how to. Yeah, we can just add a like a. Uh, Schedule build. Presumably, there's a schedule build in um, GitLab project. There are a bunch, as far as yeah. I know. Cool. Uh, anything else you'd like to show, Andrew? No, that's great. I'll cool. Stop sharing. Time. Um, well, we are almost at allocated time. I just wanted to check with you all. Uh, are you okay with going a bit over, um, like 15 minutes over? Okay. Yeah, no. also, this is kind of part with it, with what I was going to show you right after this anyway, so it worked. All right, right. let's uh, go for it. Uh, share my screen. There we go. So the thing that I've been working on, as uh, Sean and Andrew uh, probably have seen, is adding um, kind of uh, metadata tags to our sidekick logs. Um, we did that because right now the only way uh, SREs could know uh, which project a job was running for or which user triggered a job or uh, anything like that was to know kind of what the arguments, like they need to know the code and the order of the arguments to know which IDs were being used and so on. Uh, so to get around that, uh, we added metadata tags on top of the jobs. Uh, when we look into uh, Kibana, those are added. Uh, sure. To the sidekick log already, we could add them to the, the web node and so on as well, but right now they're only here and they're all these that start with meta. So these currently it's project root namespace and user. I'm just going to add these. I don't know um, if we we're going to make this public on YouTube, but we can't now. Just point that out. Uh, that's true. No worries. Don't, don't worry about it. I handle that by um, scrubbing things out when I upload. So now um, you scrub things out manually, Mara? Yeah, like I take the video stuff. and I use the soap and scrub. No, I'm joking. Okay. So, like. Yeah. This allows us to, to, to see which things are running, which user triggered them uh, inside Kick, which queue that is, and so forth. Uh, so that's visible here. And that allows us to um, build like some visualizations, like uh, the one that I had here, but it's gone now. Um, so where do I add? I'm always confused by sidekick. Terms, uh, it's, it's terms. Yeah. So if you want to see how many jobs are running for a uh, certain project, you could filter for that. And then, um, yeah, we can see, wait, I'm going to add some more because like now we will have double information. So we would, uh, what is it? What's the field named where the status is? Status, job status. I done, yeah. So this will show us like uh, which projects are like in the last 15 minutes have scheduled a lot of jobs. Uh, for example, we could add um, the queue into that.
to see if something weird comes out and I expect something weird to come out, for example, uh, the, um, it's too bad it doesn't show up right now. Maybe in the logic will be clearer because we had a bug in there as you probably know already, um, but perhaps it was fixed like in the recent deploy. So it would take a longer, Uh, and then uh, this is just already so incredibly useful. I mean, it kind of I can really yeah. I mean, so much better. I don't I don't know if we actually told anybody about this, but Stan already used this in um, something that he shared. So I think great. just having it, having it there, <laughs> people see it and they're like, oh, that's handy. They don't. I mean, it's obviously yeah. great to tell people about it, but even just having it there means that you know you can just yeah. organically yeah. find it too. Yeah, but as, as you know, like the job we had yesterday and that we've uh, worked around quite quickly uh, was that we would attribute uh, mirrors to a project that would have triggered an update, which is not like if a project receive a webhook that would prioritize its mirror update, then yeah, the updates that get scheduled because they were even more urgent than others would be attributed to that project, which is obviously incorrect. And yeah, so we fixed that yesterday. Uh, I think we have a, a video like showing how to create visual, visualizations on Kibana. Maybe we could even create like a five minute video showing how to filter using those three new attributes. Um, that's, that's handy. I actually, I actually like, Andrew, do you know what would be valuable, like, what would be a thing that you look up like uh, before here? I, uh, before this call, I was like making a visualization to see um, which are the top root namespaces that yeah. are triggering stuff, GitLab, like triggering stuff that was not remote mirrors because that's invalid. So GitLab org was a lot there. And then the thing that you were complaining about, the daily statistics, something, yeah. something is like way up there. So yeah. yeah, that's the kind of stuff that could drop out of that. Uh, let's see if I can rebuild that. Yeah, if you, I, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is useful. Um, there's, um, as well though, there is, there's, I think, um, somebody, is it Dava had a, an issue about- Yeah, it was Dava, I'll find that. Yeah. So here we can now see the bug that I was talking about. I. Um, added the root namespace here and we can see that it has a whole bunch of repository update mirror jobs um, that are attributed to something in this namespace but that's by accident probably because um yeah, uh, yeah. a webhook from github came in and then triggered the sync triggered the sync for all other projects so i for now i just filtered them out uh, but as soon as your bug fix is in production, we yeah. can kind of, this isn't going to be a problem. Uh, what are the key names again? That's um, interesting. Sorry. Yeah, I'll start with that one. Uh, project input schedule. I'm just seeing a, a root namespace there that I'm wondering whether there should be a marquee customer or not. A well known brand. Uh, so, yeah, now we can, this is more valuable. So, for example, now we see that this namespace that we saw before, get garbage collect is also going to be a consequence of that. Yeah. Um, if you if you click on it, oh, you you do. There's not one off here. What do you mean? No, there's. Uh, I mean, you can also click on the on the items like in the on the yeah, left hand side, like and, this. Yeah, and, and, the, and then do like the negate on it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah it, it doesn't matter. So right now, this is more uh, in line with what we expect. GitLab org is like the biggest one. With most key, with the uh, most workers and nailers is uh, always present there. I've noticed, and then this one is the one that 
Andrew was talking about before, which is daily statistics, which now ran a thousand something times in the past 15 minutes. Yeah, just so, on that one namespace. Just on so, that one namespace. So yeah, yeah it's a pretty active queue. Uh, this also like shows that all oh, this reoccurs for the for the all the namespaces, the top five namespaces. We run a bunch of them. Mm. Like here's the other one. So I, I think those visualizations are pretty cool. Yeah. Um, should I show you? Maybe that's mostly interesting for Oswaldo, but I could show how how we add this uh, how we add this metadata to the jobs, which would also explain why the bug was there. Um, Be, before you go and do that, which I think we should, Bob, uh, I think um, I would like you to take an action item to record one five minute video um, for like just focusing on this um, for um, uh, something that we could use to present to SREs like in the infra call, I could link that and then like radiate this information further. So like add maybe yeah, I think the run books. Also, also the abuse team are gonna love this stuff. Yeah, um, I also thought that once we have it like a little bit more confirmed, like with the bug fix and all of that, um, it would be good to mention it in the backend channels because yep. they also care which, like how their jobs are doing and yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, just uh, record one five minute video um, tomorrow, for example, uh, because right now the, your change is being deployed. So um, theoretically it should be working, right? Um, and if it does, then uh, you can just focus on, on real quick. Uh, here's how you do this uh, video. Cool, cool. Uh, I will do that. Uh, so then the code, uh, it's already yeah. master, but. Yeah. Would, would be interesting to understand like, if someone wants to add a new metadata to the context, uh, how we could do that? Like, just a Let me simple show overview. <laughs> <laughs> so in GitLab Rails, we have this um, application context file. And uh, currently these are the attributes that are known there. Um, so user project namespace. And these things are um, GitLab Rails specific. So they expect objects of these types. If you want to add something there, um, you would also have to add it to LabKit, uh, which has a context be with you, you made kind of a type check quote unquote yes that. no it's not kind of a type check it is a type check yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um the 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 file on the on the left here is like um the way the context looks like for rails that knows about namespaces the objects and so on while labkit only knows about primitive like the strings that are going to be written out into logs um yeah which you, so if you add a new value, you will need to add it in these two files. And um, one of the values that you are going to be adding is probably like the plan. So that would be like of the type plan here, but here that's just a string. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, the way the, these things get pushed is kind of uh, connected to the correlation ID. So when a request comes in, we generate cor the correlation ID and we generate a context like the one here um, that we create with one of the attributes of which is a correlation ID. Um, you can keep nesting these contexts to like specify things or remove things and so on. Um, there's a rack middleware that um, makes sure that the context gets thrown away after the request is done. The, request is done. Um, the way we add this information, uh, right now this happens in only two places. Uh, this happens in the application controller. Uh, here. So it just sets the, the namespaces, uh, the, the attributes based on what we think that the variable name inside the controller should be. 
So, um, for yeah, I example, remember doing this, this piece. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, um, inside application context, for example, if we don't have a group variable, then we are going to fall back. Like the root namespace is then going to be uh, the root namespace of the project that was selected. Tricks like that. So, we don't always need those variables to be set. Uh, for the plan, I think you can do something like that. Um, we also set this from uh, the grape endpoints in a similar way. Uh, I think I live here. Yeah, yeah. So that's where it gets pushed. Uh, the complex gets pushed on. Uh, in the API, it doesn't get popped. We count on the middleware to clean up after itself there. Um, the way it gets into the logs is in the sidekick. Um, there's a client middleware that will add the current context to the job. This is this job object here is a hash that gets written out to Psychic, uh, to Redis for the Psychic server to pick it up. And then on the server, we reinstantiate it here with the, yeah. So everything that happens within this job would have the same context. Does that make sense? Yep. Sure. Um, is there anything more? Worth mentioning. So there is one actionable item that I would like to suggest from uh, from this section. Um, feel free to uh, reject it, obviously. Um, I don't recall seeing uh, in the merge request that you created earlier, right, the, the, the main one, mm -hmm. I don't recall seeing development documentation. Um, because right now there's nothing to be done. Okay. Um, so, but, hmm, we what should... I'm trying to suggest here is that as Oswaldo goes to goes in to add new items here, um, it would be great if we document this in our development documentation on how to add whatever. Yeah, maybe and maybe then... even the concept of like we have middlewares, we have a few components, separated components. So maybe describing what each component. Uh, the, what, the, the process, maybe what the do we process. want to document here? Do we want to document how um, people can change these values? Like if they know they're going to be working on a different context within a request for whatever reason, we can document how they should be using what we built to, to add. manipulate the context? Or should we be documenting what the context looks like, which is what Oswaldo is going to change soon. I like, yeah, which is what Oswaldo is going to change soon. I think the latter is more important to us, and I think that's only going to be changed and so on by us. I think so, the latter is important for developers to know, like how this all. Like they don't need to know exactly how it works, but they need to know, like you know, this is how fields get added here. This is how. Like, you know, this is how you could add a field if you wanted to add one, stuff like that. So yep. I think, I think. And then, exactly. Uh, and then uh, for each and every one of, of the places that you showed right now, um, I would like to see that doc linked in the comments because there are already comments in there. So just add another line that links to the documentation once we have it so that we can uh, make sure that whoever reads this again, um, doesn't have to look through the video, but can also find the documentation. And um, Oswaldo, this would be your task because you're already going to be working on this uh, mm -hmm. right now. So you can also document this while you're working on it. Uh, yeah. I think the, the first one is definitely like while you're doing it, you're probably going to encounter things that I forgot to mention now. So that's probably a good idea. Should I take the second one or? I, I would I would give Oswaldo both at the moment because okay. he's dealing with the, the whole thing. Uh, and you can be the reviewer. Cool. Awesome. Uh, anything more you wanted to know around this? Uh, the next thing that I'm going to do where like 
we're still lacking a bit. Like um, the thing that I mentioned, the bug with the the mirrors, that thing, like that happened because I assumed that update all mirrors would only happen from like um, our cron job and would therefore not have metadata, but it also got triggered from requests within a project and that's, that's why it does have metadata. Um, so one of the next steps that I'm going to do is add metadata for cron jobs based on the arguments. Um, yeah, we, we have an issue for that, right? Yeah. For jobs yeah. starting on Chrome to keep the context at the yeah. end. Cool. Something like that. Uh, I think we're at that, time. Yeah. Um, so I, would, I don't want to uh, take more of your time because we already went over. Um, Bob, maybe write down your, your thoughts uh, for the next demo. And I know that there are some items that Sean added and uh, Andrew. So let's let's cover those next next time. Sure. Thank you all. Talk to you later. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye.